Hi, everyone. My name is Khalil Najafi, and I will be presenting this paper on high Q navigation grade uh, fused silico microbial bath resonator gyroscope on behalf of my uh, co authors, uh, in particular, Dr. Jae Young Cho, who is the lead author. Unfortunately, he could not be here. I'm on the faculty in electrical computer engineering at the University of Michigan. And the work that I will be presenting was work, uh, research work that was uh, performed at the University of Michigan over the past almost 10 years. Uh, this is an invited talk, and uh, I thank you for attending this talk uh, in the IEEE Sensors Conference 2021. Uh, the subject of the talk, of course, is on gyroscopes or angular rate sensors that are sensors that I can measure rotation rate and or angle of rotation. And um, rotation rate, of course, can happen in three planes, uh, typically called yaw, roll, or pitch, as shown in this uh, figure here. Just as a point of reference, the Earth turns 360 degrees in 24 hours, of course, which is 15 degrees per hour. So as we talk about, of course, uh, rotation rate, just remember that the Earth turns at uh, 15 degrees per hour. Uh, this figure um, shows a fairly um, a comprehensive summary of uh, uh, applications of uh, gyroscopes, and in particular focuses on two important parameters uh, for gyroscopes, bias drift, which of course is the drift uh, of the offset of uh, the sensor, and the noise, uh, typically referred to as angle random walk, uh, which of course uh, defines the resolution of the sensor. And uh, in this plot, as you can see, uh, there are many applications for gyroscopes. Uh, perhaps the one that most people are familiar with are uh, gyroscopes that are used in motion sensors uh, that are used in, for example, things like cell phones or game consoles and so forth. And most of these nowadays, of course, are made, uh, made out of MEMS. Uh, they're typically less than five millimeter in size and, of course, only a few dollars in price, depending, of course, on the uh, particular performance. As you can see from this plot, the uh, <clears throat> angular uh, random uh, the angle random walk or the noise for these is typically on the order uh, of about a hundred uh, or so degree uh, per hour and the bias drift is uh, usually pretty large uh, hundreds of degrees per hour but the applications don't necessarily require much better resolution than this on this plot especially on the top axis and the right axis we also show for example what affects uh, how um, noise affects things like angular resolution and their angular resolution for these applications typically is on the order of about three times 10 to the minus two degrees uh, position error that comes from the bias drift uh, might be on the order of a few kilometers. So these devices are not used for things like position measurement or position sensing. There's a whole host of applications dealing with stability of different platforms, for example, automotive applications, some drones, some platforms, uh, for example, uh, antennas, uh, satellite antennas and robots and so forth. And for these applications, the <clears throat> performance is typically about 10 times better uh, than what you can get in your motion sensors that are used in your uh, cell phones. Uh, drones, of course, uh, have um, found a lot of applications these days, anything from aerial, aerial surveying, geomapping, uh, and of course, uh, some more specific applications in robotics. And again, in these applications, the performance requirements uh, and the devices that are used are about another order of, order of magnitude better in terms of bias and, uh, and noise. Uh, there's a whole area of uh, navigation, uh, whether for underwater, space, autonomous, autonomous vehicles, including autonomous driving, uh, that um, are also very much in need of very high performance uh, gyroscopes. Typically, the bias drift is another order of magnitude better and noise, depending on the application, uh, might be also another order of magnitude better than, uh, for example, what you might need in a typical drone. Now, there's a whole range of navigation applications where gyroscopes and accelerometers are used for uh, inertial navigation based on, of course, inertial measurements uh, and uh, obviously a long uh, uh, lasting application of this has been in space and in particular in some of the military applications. And in these cases, the bias drift has to be much better than uh, 0.01 degree per hour with noise, uh, noise that um, is uh, on the order of about 0.1 milli-degree per root hour or so in that range. And uh, obviously some of these dots, by the way, show some of the current devices. Uh, the color represents uh, cost. For example, MEMS devices uh, are typically no more than a few dollars, if that. But then larger systems that are, of course, not MEMS, uh, shown in green, uh, could cost, well, uh, more than uh, $10,000 or so. 
and typically their sizes are certainly more than a few inches on the side and um, uh, and of course uh, the uh, whole field of MEMS gyroscopes or MEMS inertial sensors has advanced quite a bit and the goal eventually is to get to a point when uh, one can get perhaps a gyroscope uh, that is less than a centimeter costs perhaps around ten dollars or even less uh, but can deliver uh, almost navigation grade performance uh, with bias drift uh, on the order of about 0 0.001 degree per uh, hour and um, noise that's on the order of 0.1 to 0 0.01 milledegree per uh, per root hour. So the talk and the talk I'll uh, of course mention and discuss uh, some of the work that we have done at the University of Michigan uh, in particular in the development of uh, very small uh, meaning less than a centimeter uh, gyroscopes that can deliver uh, very high performance. <clears throat> and now, uh, most of these gyroscopes, in particular MEMS gyroscopes, uh, utilize uh, the vibration of some kind of a solid device uh, and utilize the Coriolis effect. Let me very quickly talk about the Coriolis effect. Uh, the Coriolis effect essentially, or force, uh, it's an apparent force or acceleration that arises in a rotating frame of reference. So imagine a particle traveling at a velocity v and that uh, in a reference frame and that frame is rotating around let's say this in this case the z-axis. Uh, there is an apparent uh, Coriolis acceleration uh, with the direction that's perpendicular to the plane formed by uh, the velocity direction and the axis of rotation. And uh, so to someone in that uh, frame uh, sitting there uh, they basically can see as this uh, frame of reference rotates, that that moving particle uh, will uh, change direction uh, as if uh, some force, uh, some fictitious force essentially is uh, moving it. Uh, one can imagine, for example, in a device, uh, obviously that uh, is not a particle traveling uh, continuously, but a device that might be vibrating. For example, a prismatic beam that might be vib vibrating uh, front and back as shown here. And if it's rotate, rotated along its uh, long axis, in this case, the z-axis, then the Coriolis acceleration will uh, basically felt uh, and apply in the direction perpendicular to the plane formed by this uh, axis of rotation and of course the, uh, uh, the uh, direction of vibration. And that's why typically this direction of vibration is referred to as a drive uh, mode and or the drive axis. And this axis where you um, uh, see the effect of Coriolis acceleration as the sense mode or the sense axis. Of course, one can put a device like this in resonance. So this device would be moving back and forth. And of course, then the uh, Coriolis acceleration will also be a um, <clears throat> oscillating signal that causes the beam uh, to move uh, in this direction as shown here. Uh, obviously, the higher the frequency, the larger the effective velocity, and therefore, uh, potentially, the larger the Coriolis effect. So if one looks at the Coriolis force, uh, one can uh, get a relationship, simple relationship like this, that shows the force to be proportional to the mass of the uh, particle, the mass of this device, its frequency, uh, the drive amplitude, or the oscillation amplitude. And of course, as I said, that force is proportional to uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, angular rotation or rotation rate. It's clear that if you want to get a large force and therefore a large um, motion in the uh, sense axis, one needs to get a large mass, uh, have a very large drive amplitude, and have also a very large frequency. Naturally, when you miniaturize devices, especially when you go to MEMS scale, less than a centimeter or so, uh, this force uh, will uh, be dramatically smaller than something that might be a few inches on a side. Uh, and therefore, uh, both A and M uh, will go down substantially. Uh, fortunately, of course, as the device gets smaller, you can, of course, resonate it and move it at a much higher frequency. Uh, but in any case, you still would like to maximize the mass, the drive amplitude, and the uh, uh, resonant motion of this device. Now, there are two parameters that I mentioned before that are really critical in uh, determining the overall performance of a vibratory gyroscope. One is noise, angle random walk, uh, which in most of these devices is given by typically thermomechanical noise uh, given through this equation. Uh, mechanical noise, essentially the limit, the resolution limit will be proportional to one over A times the root of one over omega MQ. Again, A, the drive amplitude, omega, a resonant frequency, M the mass, and Q the quality factor of resonance. 
clearly from this, you can see that in order to minimize this noise, one needs to maximize quality factor, mass, increase the resonant frequency, and uh, also increase the uh, drive amplitude. Another parameter is bias or stability of the bias. And even though there is no particular equation that one can show, but um, one can show that uh, the drift in the bias is proportional to omega over A sub G times Q, where again, omega is frequency, A is the angular gain, typically a maximum of one, and Q is the quality factor. Uh, as I said before, for many of these applications, of course, you'd like the bias to be uh, the bias drift to be as small as possible. So again, here, you'd like to reduce the resonant frequency, maximize Q, and uh, there's a really very limited range of what you can do with A sub G. Um, another parameter that doesn't really directly show, at least in this expression that I've shown, is ring down time. And ring down time, of course, is the time from the time, uh, time it takes for a resonance to die down to approximately 70% or so <clears throat> of its peak value. And uh, ring down time is given by 2Q divided by omega. And this is a very important parameter uh, that will, of course, determine uh, bias drift. And for this, of course, you want to maximize Q. And as you can see, you want to minimize <coughs> omega. Now, uh, the noise says that you want to maximize omega. Uh, bias uh, drift says you want to minimize omega. And clearly, uh, one of the important things is to try to keep omega as large as possible in order to reduce noise and, uh, and of course get a larger uh, Coriolis effect, but also in order to uh, uh, get, of course, the bias uh, drift as small as possible, the only way you can do this is by maximizing Q. And this is really one of the things that uh, has achieved in larger scale devices. They have large mass. They don't necessarily have very large Q, but as I will show you, there are some devices uh, resonant devices uh, on the larger scale that <clears throat> uh, solve this problem of uh, bias stability and uh, uh, noise by essentially maximizing Q. <coughs> Let me also mention that, of course, if one looks at the past history of MEMS gyros over the past 30 years or so, really a tremendous progress has been made. Uh, by the late 1980s, when um, some of the first concepts of MEMS uh, gyroscopes were presented and reported, uh, noise was on the order of about 10,000 degrees per root hour. And now, uh, in fact, NEMS devices uh, have reached uh, better than 0 0.001. In fact, our BRG device that I will report today, uh, we call it Psi, is on the order of about 0 0.001 uh, degrees per root hour. Uh, this is amazing progress, right? Uh, something on the order of about 10 million improvement in device performance really over a fairly short period of time. In fact, this plot uh, shows that performance improvement in these MEMS gyroscopes has been more impressive than even uh, the uh, improvement in circuit, uh, integrated circuits as represented by Moore's law. <clears throat> there are a lot of different vibratory structures used for building these MEMS gyroscopes. Uh, of course, as I talked about the uh, prismatic beam that could be resonated back and forth, but in order to um, improve quality factor, a tuning fork has been really a, uh, uh, a main uh, device uh, structure used pretty much for all of the MEMS gyroscopes that, for example, are used in consumer devices, but even for higher performance devices. Uh, more recently, they have been resonating discs and rings over the past 20 years or so. Again, these are all basically flat structures that could be fabricated using standard planar microfabrication techniques. But there's another uh, group of vibrating structure, uh, structures called vibrating shells, like a wine glass or a uh, vibrating cylinder. And these are 3D structures and they really offer several advantages, including the fact that you can get a much higher quality factor. They're much more tolerant to shock and vibration. And of course they can potentially provide larger mass. Obviously, because they're 3D structures, their fabrication will be a little bit more involved. And of course, uh, they will take up a little bit more volume uh, for a given footprint, of course, because they're three-dimensional. So let me say, let me talk about how essentially a uh, wine glass or a resonance shell device uh, could operate as a gyroscope, something that can measure uh, rotation rate. So if you take a wine glass and you hit the rim with, of the wine glass, you obviously know that it will begin to vibrate. You can hear it, for example, if you take a wine glass and the vibration pattern of the rim uh, will be in a particular um, N2 mode. Uh, it's essentially a flexural mode and the vibration pattern will be elliptical. Now, if you turn the wine glass around its stem, uh, let's say by 90 degrees, 
the vibration pattern will rotate and will lag behind uh, by 27 degrees, but it will still rotate. So therefore, by monitoring and in some ways, in fact, controlling where these vibration patterns might fall, it is possible then to directly measure angular rotation and the angle of rotation using essentially a wine glass gyroscope. The ring structure that I showed you in the previous slide and the disc structures basically do the same thing. Now, of course, these all of these devices utilize the Coriolis effect in their measurement. <clears throat> uh, the world's highest performance vibratory gyroscope of any kind is the hemispherical resonator gyro, which was developed way back when by Delco, and of course is now owned and produced by Northrop Grumman. This essentially is a wine glass made out of fused silica, it's made uh, using um, uh, uh, machining techniques. Uh, this device is approximately three centimeters or so <clears throat> in diameter. And in order to get the high quality factor, one needs to, of course, do precision machining and uh, ensure that this entire glass is very, very symmetrical. Uh, when you hit it, it rings and it rings for a long time. It could ring for as uh, long as about 10 minutes or so. Uh, as a result, it provides a very large quality factor, more than 20 million operating at about 3000 Hertz. And in fact, these vibratory gyroscopes uh, <clears throat> are excellent gyroscopes of any kind that have been used in a lot of various applications, including many uh, space applications. Uh, again, as I said, this is made out of fused silica uh, and the um, uh, structure is coated with a thin conductor and then surrounded by capacitive electrodes that can drive this uh, structure into resonance and of course sense the motion of the vibration patterns as you rotate the gyroscope along uh, around uh, around its central axis. This shows the package device of course this is uh, housed inside a vacuum housing with a whole bunch of other controls but as you can see uh, dimensions are on the order of about a few centimeters in order to be able to provide stability of uh, better than uh, uh, 0.001 degree per hour. And in fact, versions of this device can do much better even than this. Very good bandwidth, excellent, excellent <coughs> full scale range and shock and vibration tolerance. So the work at Michigan uh, has focused on essentially building uh, a uh, micro machine wine glass three dimensional shell structure uh, but uh, at a scale much smaller than what I just mentioned before. In this case, the um, few silica structure is shown in yellow here. Uh, it's like a bird bath. It's attached to a substrate at an anchor point. It's surrounded by drive and sense electrodes, capacitive electrodes that are separated from the shell by a gap of about 10, 15, 20 microns or so. This is another drawing just showing essentially the same shell uh, attached upside down to the substrate with the capacitive electrodes. And as I said, this is uh, made uh, out of uh, fused silica, and the reason is fused silica is an insulating material. Uh, and because uh, of some of the excellent properties of these uh, of the fused silica, it can provide excellent quality factor and resonance. Now, the process technology that we've developed at Michigan is based on a blowtorch, and the blowtorch is used to reflow fused silica. Fused silica um, softens at around 1600 degrees centigrade. So we take a few silica substrate, use a mold that has a cavity underneath the substrate. And when you bring a blowtorch, fuel oxygen blowtorch that can get up to uh, more than 1600 degrees, the few silica substrate will begin to soften. If there is vacuum applied in the chamber right below the fused silica, then the softened material will settle down into the cavity. And if there is a post, like as I've shown here in this particular case, you can form this particular shape, which looks almost like a bird bath. Uh, this video shows a quick uh, way. This is a blowtorch, fuel oxygen, uh, a mold, a, a fuel silica uh, uh, a substrate that's attached as the uh, torch is brought down. Uh, the fuel silica substrate, as I just showed you before, will soften and it will settle into the mold. Now, it doesn't have to take the shape of the mold, but the mold defines essentially the <clears throat> boundary and the volume uh, of this particular structure. This process is very fast. <coughs> the entire molding process could take no more than about 10 seconds. And one of the reasons is because fused silica is excellent material, very low thermal expansion coefficients. Therefore, you can heat it up and cool it down without really worrying about it being damaged. Uh, this shows a photograph of uh, that substrate that has not been molded or reflowed. And this is about five millimeters in diameter. 
the thickness of this shell goes anywhere from about 80 microns around the rim to perhaps 15, 20 microns in some of the thinner regions. And this central region essentially is the pulse that uh, uh, will support uh, the resonant rim uh, that's right around here. In this case, of course, the original substrate is still attached. We need to get rid of and remove that flat part of the substrate. And we do that by essentially chemically, mechanically polishing away these uh, flat parts so that you can end up essentially with this little cup, uh, which very much looks like a bird bath. That's a micro bird bath and therefore a micro bird bath resonator. This shows <clears throat> the, um, uh, the resonator. Again, this is five millimeters in diameter, approximately 80 microns thickness of the rim. And uh, as you can see, it's a very, very smooth, very symmetrical structure. And obviously the technology has to uh, be able to accommodate <clears throat> a very smooth surface with minimal damage and, and so forth in order to obtain a very large quality factor. So this shell is now mounted on a substrate attached using various uh, techniques, glass frits, and so some specific solders. And if the substrate has electrodes on it, in this case, we fabricated tall silicon electrodes, uh, then you can uh, use these electrodes to drive and sense the motion of, the, um, of this resonator. So the photograph shown here, again, this is a five millimeter diameter structure. The fused silica shell here, it's bare, but it's here is uh, coated with a thin conductor and capacitor uh, electrodes that uh, surround the uh, structure and are separated from it by a gap of about 15 microns or so. You can make these in different sizes. This shows a 10 millimeter device, which we call VRG10 or Psi10, VRG5, and of course, uh, properties such as quality factor and so change depending on the particular size that you use. Now, as I said, quality factor and uh, ring down time are very important. Uh, this plot shows uh, measurements of a 10 millimeter device um, that uh, really has provided the highest performance. Uh, a 10 millimeter device operating at about five kilohertz provides a quality factor of about 8 million uh, with a ring down time of about 500 seconds, which really are both records uh, as far as devices that are made this size. If you make the uh, device a little bit higher frequency, ring down time uh, goes down, but quality factor actually exceeds 10 million. And again, this is a record and uh, uh, amazing that one can achieve a quality factor of resonance of 10 million uh, for a device at about 11 kilohertz or so, uh, that's only about 10 millimeters in diameter. <clears throat> and uh, this is indeed what uh, then uh, allows the use of these devices in very high performance gyroscopes. I should mention the quality fact, the limits of quality factor uh, are multiple factors, but in this particular uh, devices, uh, part of the um, uh, loss comes through uh, anchor. Of course, the device needs to be symmetrical. Uh, and the uh, anchor support. And then the other is surface loss. We think that uh, thermoelastic damping uh, is uh, very, very minimal in this case because fused silica is an insulator and some of the other effects like fluidic damping and so forth of uh, the pat devices packaged in vacuum uh, are really not uh, that significant. Uh, so making the devices more symmetric uh, to uh, ensure that uh, uh, anchor loss is minimized and also uh, as uh, good of a surface uh, and material deposited on the surface to minimize surface loss. So our group really has um, uh, held a record in this area for devices on the order of about a centimeter in diameter. Uh, this shows uh, the red dots or uh, triangles show improvement over the past eight, nine, 10 years that our group has made uh, in terms of achieving uh, bring down times on the order of about 500 seconds. There are several groups around the world that have been doing this. Um, we've been uh, able to achieve a higher performance in this regard for various reasons that um, I mentioned in terms of how to fabricate the device and how to maintain symmetry and cleanliness. Now these devices are then packaged in a ceramic package. This is a five millimeter device, a 10 millimeter device, and then capped essentially in vacuum of uh, around one millimeter or so in order to be able to provide this high quality factor. This shows a completely packaged device, fused silica shell resonator, 10 millimeter in diameter, coated with a thin conductor. And after packaging, uh, the quality factors on the order of about 5.3 million, operating at 5.6 kilohertz, ring down time of about 300 seconds. <clears throat> and the mismatch in frequency between the two modes on the order of about one to three hertz. And that of course you can essentially uh, tune uh, using electronic tuning afterwards. Um, I won't go through the electronics, but essentially, of course, you need external electronics to both 
uh, get the device into resonance and then operate, uh, maintain the resonance, and of course, measure the device output and some additional digital uh, electronics in order to process the data and be able to extract essentially rotation angle from measured amplitude of vibration uh, through schemes that uh, have been published in the past and really uh, mostly pioneered by David Lynch and many of the work that he's done on the hemispherical resonant gyro. Uh, this shows uh, <clears throat> measurement results from a five millimeter device on a 10 millimeter device. And uh, the most significant result uh, we've obtained is uh, for a 10 millimeter device that I just showed you uh, with angle random walk of 0.16 milledegrees per root hour and a bias stability of 1.38 milliDegrees per hour. And for devices this size, this is by far uh, the best performance reported of any <clears throat> miniature micro machine devices. And uh, we believe that in fact, this performance could be even better. Over the years, um, uh, this is performance improvement of uh, the BRG over the years. Uh, our five millimeter devices, these three dots of course have improved as we've been able to improve quality factor. And the same thing with 10 millimeter device with the higher quality factor and the longer ring down time, uh, as I mentioned before, one can get really excellent angle random walk and bias stability. And of course, uh, all of these measurements, by the way, were done in run under no temperature control. And we believe that as uh, one improves uh, the electronics and perhaps um, some of the parameters in the device in terms of symmetry, one can achieve performance levels that are even better than this. And so there's no question that these miniature, basically MEMS-based gyroscopes uh, at less than a centimeter can achieve navigation grade and beyond. And uh, there are many, many applications for these devices as they get more commercialized. I should also mention the blowtorch processing uh, technology that we've developed is very reliable, extremely reproducible, and uh, it's actually fairly easily adaptable to a batch process to lower cost. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't had time to go through, uh, through that discussion, but we've done many studies and done uh, many measurements, and we know that uh, these results could be <clears throat> replicated and reproduced fairly easily. Let me finish by acknowledging uh, funding from uh, DARPA, uh, from the um, US Department of Defense. Uh, this is a basic research project, uh, funding on research uh, on uh, shell resonators, the BRG, uh, has uh, been uh, through two DARPA grants over the past 10 years or so. I also support, uh, appreciate the support of uh, obviously all of our students as, as well as staff of the Lorian Nanofabrication Fabric Facility at the University of Michigan. Uh, we should also disclose that Dr. Jae Young Cho is the CEO and a co-founder of Inertial Microsystems, which is a startup out of the University of Michigan, which is commercializing the BRG, and I am also a co-founder. So with that, I thank you for your time and appreciate uh, your interest in this work. And if there are any questions for those of you who uh, are not live, obviously, please uh, send me your questions and we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you.